Welcome to the Ottawa International Writers' Festival. Our 2020 virtual season is broadcasting from the unceded and unsurrendered territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe. Welcome to the Ottawa International Writers' Festival. My name is Sean Wilson. I'm the Artistic Director. I'm recording this on the unceded, unsurrendered territory of the Anishinaabe Algonquin Nation, and I want to thank our friends at the Ottawa Public Library and Library and Archives Canada for collaborating with us on our virtual 2020 season, and I want to thank you for tuning in. While we're hugely grateful to the Government of Canada, the Government of Ontario, the City of Ottawa, and the Canada Council for the Arts, and the Ontario Arts Council for their invaluable support in these difficult times, it is our festival members, volunteers, and audiences who are at the core of our community. Your support is the heart and soul of all we do, so thank you. If you enjoyed this video, please consider making a tax-creditable donation to support our programming and children's literacy initiatives. And most importantly, please shop locally and read widely. Our guest today is the author of Transcendence, How Humans Evolved Through Fire, Language, Beauty, and Time. Guy Events is a science writer and broadcaster who has held senior editorial posts at Nature and New Scientist and writes for Science, The Guardian, and others. She spoke with us from London. I want to remind everyone that signed copies of her book are available from Perfect Books if you are tuning in here in Ottawa. Guy Events. Gaia, thank you so much for being with us uh, today. It was, um, you know, one of the brutal things about having to cancel our spring festival was uh, not getting to meet you in person, but I'm thrilled that you are here with us uh, virtually at least, and um, we'll have uh, signed copies of your book available uh, from Perfect Books here in Ottawa. And um, anyway, it's just fantastic to talk to you. I feel like 2020, um, at least on the book side, has been an incredible year for exciting science books. I'm thinking of, of uh, Underland, Robert McFarland, um, uh, Rutger Bregman's book, um, and then the one I just finished, uh, Merlin, uh, Merlin Sheldrake's book on, on fungus, which is just like mind blowing. And you touch on that a little bit in the book, uh, the sort of the, the complexity of, of the tiny life forms and, and how that, that speaks to us. So transcendence is the story of humanity. Um, the story of life itself. So there's a lot of ground to cover. Uh, we're not going to get to everything, which is probably good because everyone needs to run out and buy a copy of the book. But I guess, what's the best place to start? Do we want to start with the, the basic premise is that um, although all life is, is subject to the same evolutionary forces, um, humans are very clearly unique. So maybe we want to start with what is it? The evolutionary triad. Uh, is that a good place to start? It's, it's incredibly, it's incredibly complex. I just want to say that, like, I wish that I was in Ottawa. I was really looking forward to um, to coming to Canada and seeing um, all the all the Ottawans. Do you call yourself <laughs> Ottawans? We do. We try not to refer to ourselves that often, uh, but when we do, we are <laughs> Ottawans, and uh, we definitely will have you here in person when when. Uh, when that's possible again. I can't wait until we're able to gather again in person. There's something electric about that connection between the author and the audience. And you know, one of the things with, with literary events is unlike a, a rock show or a fashion show or something, it's the intimacy is what is so beautiful. Um, you know, we, we read alone, we tend to read alone, although your book, uh, as I was telling you uh, before we started filming, I listened to uh, you read it uh, with my family, but generally we read alone. And then there's this great opportunity to come together as a community and, and you look around and you realize that you're not alone, right? It's this great moment. And so- For the writer, um, for the writer as well, it's so important because you spend so much time on your own, you know, wrestling with these ideas and you, you don't um, share them with anybody really apart from the page. And um, it's quite a stressful process actually writing a book. It's very intense and then I just love that um, coming out at the end, the events where you where you get to meet the readers and talk about these ideas and and um, and see your ideas reflected in them and and, and discuss them and, and meet all the other writers. I mean, it really is that's the fun part of writing books. So so this year has been kind of hard in that in that way. Um, yeah. 
yeah, so I'm really sad um, not to be coming to Ottawa, but it's so lovely to talk to you from here anyway. Um, and we can do it. That's the great thing about technology. Well, I mean, again, and this kind of does tie in with your book is, is we are, it's so implausible, isn't it? I mean, life itself just, it, it seems to me implausible that everything happened as it did. And there you are in London, England, and we're using technology and I'm here on unceded Algonquin territory talking to you remotely. And it's almost like we're together. I mean, it's not quite as good, um, but this is pretty cool. It's you know? amazing. It's amazing. And and so coming back to your question about evolution, well, you know, I mean, obviously, um, I, ha I come from a science background, and I, I don't think that we were just sort of created in, in you know by some god and just placed there as as we are. You know, I think that we come from this huge legacy that ultimately goes back to one individual cell, you know, billions of years ago, and um, it's part of a biologically evolutionary um, uh, uh, legacy. Um, but then, you know, we, when we awesome, the chimpanzee we're very similar we're, we're you know only a few um, percent of genes um, are different in our in our dna but yet we are extraordinary we are unlike all the other animals you know the chimpanzees are not chatting over um, a video conference call we are so different and and to me that is the biggest question you know how on earth did did we get to this stage through through the evolutionary process? You know, if you if you subscribe to that as I do, um, that everything was that, that we did evolve, then how come we are this incredible creature that, as humanity, has fundamentally changed our entire planet? Has changed the way that chimpanzees, our closest relatives, live. They are now endangered, whereas we are the very opposite of endangered. We've, we've changed even the um, the temperature of the atmosphere. We've changed everything. And so how on earth did that happen? And that, that was the biggest question to me, always. And um, that's what I set out to try to try to answer. Well, and now you, you point out that most of the biology is unchanged for millions of years. And yet our brains are what? Our brains did change, change massively in ways that our closest ancestors didn't, right? So there's a feedback loop that you talk about there about brain size and about culture. And I wanna just talk a little bit about, so what happened? So everything's trucking along. Uh, we've got our primate cousins and, um, you know, I mean, you do in the book get into what to me, the Paleolithic era, the most fascinating idea to me is that there were actually different humans. Um, like this, you know, Sapiens touched on it. Uh, uh, Claire Cameron, a Canadian writer, wrote a beautiful novel called The Last Neanderthal about the relationship between Sapiens and uh, Neanderthal uh, um, living, coexisting, and, and that what it must have been like to look and see a person that is clearly a person, but to be a, an actual different race, not this business that we're so caught up with, uh, which is really literally skin deep uh, in terms of the biology, but different people. So. Tell us just to go back to that thing. What happens that makes our brains just just go on a different track than everyone else? That that, that starts to they get bigger and bigger. Yeah. Um, so this 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 evolutionary process changed. So for us, it became not just about biologically adapting to our environment. So the environment exerts. Um, pressures on every single organism, evolutionary pressures, which is why um, a cheetah can run very fast, a monkey can climb, all those sorts of things. And one of the things that emerged as a response was the idea of culture. So, so we became cultural beings, and we can see some of the some of the beginnings of that. It requires so culture is um, the transmission of. Um, of an idea or a behavior or a practice among a group. In this case, it's about um, a behavior or a practice or a way of doing things. And um, so for that, you need to be very social. So we see some of this, we see social animals and we see that they are, they do have some practices that are really, um, uh, really specific, but most of those are innate. So um, ants, for example, are incredible, you know, they build these nests, they have all sorts of really cool behaviours. Um, monkeys um, and other primates, and then you move on to the apes, to chimpanzees, who have some really complex behaviours which they copy 
from each other. One of one chimpanzee practice, for example, is uh, cracking nuts with mm. another stone, which um, is very, very clever for a primate. For us, it's a completely basic and a, and a small toddler would get to that stage. So they independently can invent that, but they also can copy another um, chimpanzee and the, the tools that they use and the behaviors and the way that they do that we can say are very primitive cultures because they're specific to a particular little population of chimps but somewhere in our ancestry the behaviors and uh, practices and tools that we made became so sophisticated and multi-step you know, a tool needed to be, um, a hand axe, say, needed to be uh, cut in so many different ways. Shall I get you a hand axe? Actually, I have one here oh, that cool. I made. <laughs> Homemade um, hand axe. Yeah. So I actually made this myself oh, with God. lessons, right? Because I couldn't make this myself. And that's the, I'll, I'll try and hold it up to the Yeah, that's beautiful. Uh, wow. Camera, so well, I'm very proud of it because, um, you know, <laughs> <laughs> this is not my this is not my skill set. No, but so you had to learn how to this sort of ties in with what we're talking about. You had to learn how to do that whereas uh, uh, most of our primate uh, um, cousins, I guess, w would would know intuitively what they have to do, right? So for example, this um, is this this I had to be taught, but you know, presumably given lots and lots of time given uh, years I could come up with this idea myself and um, that's great here we are I have a tool now the thing is what happens is we don't just have this tool you know we also have this tool right which I couldn't come up with myself we also have um, this tool you probably haven't seen one of these for a long time <laughs> <laughs> so so you know we have this very complicated toolbox and there came a point in our um, in our evolution where the number of tools that we have and their sophistication their multi-step technology so this is made from multiple parts but consider just um, an arrowhead which um, also needs the um, the arrow shaft which is made of wood you have to have the right sort of stone you have to cut it in a certain way then it needs to be um, attached in some way right which needs um, mm -hmm. you need the gum from a certain tree you need to wrap it in a certain way and then then you need to learn how to fire the damn thing and, and or how to, um, you know, if it's a spear, how to throw it. So all of these come together and there comes a point in our ancestry where we look at the tool collection that people had and we say that these couldn't independently have been invented by a certain person in their lifetime. Um, it just, it, it's not possible. And if we look at chip tools, yes, they all could. They right. all could. Then none of them are so sophisticated that, that an individual chimp couldn't couldn't come up with it themselves but if you look at homo erectus our two million year old ancestor it's too sophisticated already they were already copying each other and learning from each other and um, over time what happens is things become more refined so this might look kind of basic and a bit crappy and to be honest it is it's my first attempt I'm and impressed. this is not a Sophisticated. Thank you. It's not as sophisticated as many of the tools that we found that go back hundreds of thousands of years, because people were much better at doing this now. Just just as you know, I my handwriting is a lot better than um, one of theirs would be. I'm trying to think of something I can do that they can't do. <laughs> well, video teleconferencing. So, so what happens over generations? We refine the tools, and evolution plays a part. So. Um, um, you know, uh, it turns out that having a sharp edge to your axe is um, is much better than having a blunt edge for, for whatever I want to use it for. And it, so um, that evolutionary process plays out over generations and it plays out through um, through my group until we end up having very sophisticated technologies. And that um, that 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 basically propels us in terms of how we manage our energy. And Right. And sorry. so this becomes also where larger groups of people, right, larger gatherings become super important because you got more perspectives on every task. There's there's somebody that's really good at making arrowheads, somebody that's good at making musical instruments, somebody that's whatever, right? And so this is where we start yeah, to see so the need every to come single together. evolutionary with every single evo um, system in nature, and not just in nature, with every system, um, it involves diversification. 
um, and complexity. So um, the more, so so then you get um, you get specialisms. You know, over time, evolution has specified has um, has gone for specialisation, and um, that's the same in a large society. Someone's very good at making this. Someone else is very good at um, throwing spears, and um, these jobs become specialised. So the the bigger your society, the more likely it is that you'll have those specialisms, and the more likely is hood is that you will have that knowledge there. So bigger groups um, 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 become uh, b bigger groups have more complex and sophisticated um, uh, practices and tool sets generally. And of course, the more uh, the successful you are um, in terms of making all these things, the more likely you are to survive and um, your offspring are to survive. So the more likely your group is to be bigger. So there's that feedback that goes on in, in so many of these processes. So culture is the survival strategy that we adopt early on, all, presumably all of the, the people, the various kinds of people. Um, and you sort of define, I think, when you, when you start to get into the, the four uh, ways that you're looking at, at how we became who we are, you start with fire. And it seems to me that fire is community. Right, fire is that we're gathering together, we're sharing, we're, we've got the warmth, and it's also the first uh, you describe the first offloading, right, of, of energy. Um, we are no longer needing to produce everything ourselves. We're going to use the fire, um, and so I'm wondering if you can talk just a little bit about you know why how you chose fire, why fire is so fundamental, that part of it, and then I think also just this ties in with um, kind of uh, it's almost the illusion of autonomy. Right, that we have, we, we think of ourselves as 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 autonomous beings. Our 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 neighbors to the south uh, like to say, "Land of the free, home of the brave." The you know, um, individualism, and yet, the more we study, the more clear it is that autonomy doesn't really exist. Right? I mean, we we only exist as interconnected parts of a larger whole. So anyway, there's a lot there. But so let's start with let's start with fire, the spark, and and. And how that changed, uh, how that created community, how that changed just just our whole relationship with the world. Yeah. So, fire is all about energy. Um, I, I mean, I started with fire because it's so powerful. But to me, to me, um, I think of life and I think of evolution itself as being a system that. Um, that tends towards um, the most efficient use of energy. So if we think of, a uni of the universe as um, life, as um, a reduction in entropy, well, it's so, so we have this chaos of atoms and molecules and, and all that, and we have to somehow assemble it into this um, system the DNA molecule or um, a protein molecule, and then that system becomes even more specialized and even more um, tied down until we get very sophisticated beings like a hummingbird or um, an ant or us. Um, so, so we get this massive reduction of entropy, and that involves energy, of course. And so for life to exist, um, it needs to take energy out of its environment, and most of them, most um, life forms do that through eating, um, and then you know plants do it through photosynthesis, and so that limits really the activities of every living organism, how much energy it can uh, consume, and so animals like uh, cows, um, for example, or koala bears spend their whole day eating because they they just what they eat is such a low energy supply or it's so difficult to get that energy to their cells now we really did something incredible so we get our energy not just from our food but we also um we also um sorry i can't think of the word but we 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 um hijack external sources of energy and fire is the most obvious one and it's one of the first ones I think that we use so um, fire provides heat externally for us so we don't have to keep ourselves warm um, you know we're hairless um, we fire gives us light so we get more time in our day after darkness fire helps us gather round and that's a really important um, key thing which you mentioned about energy so if the whole community is doing something we get um, is, is involved in an activity and um, there's the economy of scale so right. for me to uh, do anything physical or to do anything mental by myself takes a lot of energy but if I can rely on someone else 
um, telling me the answer. If I can look it up on Google, that takes no time at all and no energy from me. Um, I'm, I'm relying on outsourcing my energy supply to the internet or to a library. Right. Moving somewhere, if I want to move from here to, um, to Paris, I can, instead of walking there, which would take me a lot of time and be very effortful, I can get on a train, which is, um, you know, it, so, so that, that energy of motion, again, is, is, I don't have to invest any energy in that. Physically, so in terms of how much I have to get, how much food I have to get to source my lifestyle, it suddenly becomes much smaller with every uh, increment. Now, primarily to that, the mo perhaps the first, the first most fundamental use of energy in um, our ancestral evolution um, that led to all this was the externalization of our guts. So we started mm. cooking our food. So instead of our bodies, if you look at a cow, it's got all these different stomachs and it takes a long, long time because uh, grass is very cellulosic. It's very difficult to break down. Um, well, you know, if we hunt a, a wildebeest, same problem. You know, it takes a lot of time for our um, guts to digest it. If you've ever had a really big barbecue, you'll know what I'm talking about. It's a heavy, <laughs> heavy experience. <laughs> Um, and raw food, just, it, yeah, raw food, you don't get the, 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 you're not able, we're not able to absorb anywhere near as much, right? We can't even, yeah, we can't survive on raw food. We couldn't. Um, it would, we just wouldn't have the time and the energy to, uh, to eat enough to keep our big brains going. But of course, when this all started in our ancestry, our brains were smaller. And this is one of the key evolutionary things. So we're talking about the, um, yeah, what I call, <laughs> I've invented this phrase, the evolutionary triad, the human yeah. evolutionary triad, which is environment, biology, genes, and culture, and all three feed back on each other. So we live in an, if we live in an environment like um, a savanna environment, which we helped create through burning landscapes, right, in our ancestry, um, which encourages lots of herbivores which means we can hunt them and so so basically we go from being um foraging primates that live in the trees and eat um uh fruit and berries we we become primarily meat eaters um you know we get our energy from that to digest that takes a long time and it's very difficult and lions spend a long time sleeping and they don't have a lot of time for um you know, calculus or um, writing Shakespearean plays. So um, in order to, for our brains to grow bigger, we had to somehow get um, a boost of energy from somewhere, and that was cooking. So cooking basically does a massive pre-digestion job for our bodies. So we get, um, we get it pre-prepared for us, and that completely dramatically changed our brains and enabled them to, over generations, grow bigger and bigger. And, uh, yeah, so our brains are significantly bigger um, for our body size than um, other animals. And so we're using fire. Um, I mean, there are many animals that use fire, but so we're using fire for, you're suggesting two things at the beginning. One is outsourcing digestion. Uh, well, three things maybe, and also warmth and, and, and light. But then I re it's interesting that right from the beginning, uh, we're creating the savanna. We're changing the environment, right? Which is, again, I love your tri the triad idea because it's not just nature and nurture. There's There's wheels within wheels. But so we start early on rather than adapting to, hey, wow, here's a tree, let's get better at climbing, we say, hey, here's a tree, let's build something to take it down so we can burn it, right? And then we can change the environment. So this becomes really the thing that separates us from the rest of life as we know it, right? Yeah, and now we, we, we have gone on this process of modifying our environment. So, so all um, are exquisitely adapted to their ecological niche. You know, you will find uh, frogs by freshwater bogs. You will find, um, uh, you know, eagles on high crags. You know, everything is adapted to its environment. But we adapt our environment to ourselves. Hmm. So we tra take an inhosp inhospitable forest, we get rid of it, put down tarmac and put houses there. And we live in houses. We don't live in caves anymore. We live in houses that are, are artificial caves, which are just um, adapted to exactly um, to make it easy for us, everything. And so 
what we've done now is on such a scale that we've done mm. it to the entire planet. So we're now in the Anthropocene, you know, the age of humans, where we are the dominating force over all life, you know, and all um, Earth processes, which is quite incredible for one species that's only been around for, you know, two to three hundred thousand years. Well, and, you know, this is... It's so important for our evolution. It's so exciting. It's it's beautiful and it's optimistic when you're talking about it in, in this this it, I feel like, wow, this is exciting. But is it safe to say that maybe this strength, this need to change our environment that, that was so beautiful at the beginning has actually become our a stumbling block. This is behavior that uh, seems to be possibly pushing us towards extinction. We may have gone too far. Yeah, so so what's happened now is that we have become so successful. And, and if you look at how we measure success in a species, it's normally mm. through population. So we are now the, the most populous big animal around, and all the other big animals, the next in line with big animals, are ones that we have created ourselves through breeding or, um, to feed and serve us, you know? So we've completely modified everything. Um, so we are this huge population, nearly 8 billion people. Um, and at the same time, we have changed the climate, um, threatening ourselves. We've reduced biodiversity and we've actually threatened our own survival in all sorts of different ways. So, so we've done this kind of intentionally. We didn't unintentionally. We did not set out originally you know, um, 100,000 years ago and think, okay, let's let's head down this path and eventually we'll be at the Anthropocene and be brilliant, let's go for it. You know, we didn't do that intentionally. Even when we decided to burn coal, we didn't do it thinking, oh, we're going to make um, a 37-degree summer that I'm experiencing in London, right. uh, the north. Yeah, incredible. So um, none of this is intentional, but now, of course, it's, it is a huge threat and now... We know that it's a huge threat, and we know the reason. We know that we are the reason, and we know where it could lead us because we have all this knowledge and expertise, and we have those models. And so to continue doing it now is a completely different... Um, different. It's, it's, this, is, this is not the same. We are now heading into a new era, and it's a new time, and uh, we are in a different state. So we have become a different creature. Um, which is something I talk about in the book. I, I say that we are acting now not as other species and not as um, individuals. We're now acting as a superorganism because the way we behave is now global. Um, so you and I are not causing this problem, but as humanity, we are causing this problem. Right. Um, and we will be affected by this global problem as individuals as well as um, a global population. And of course, because of this is all systems you know this is yeah. what fascinates me human systems earth systems and their interaction and and so um because of the systems that we've created it, um, and these systems include global inequality poverty all sorts of um environmental degradation all these uh, different sort of built-in systems we can't just um we can't we can't just uh continue in this way and and be blind to the fact mm. that certain sectors of our global society, our global super organism, are going to be affected much, much more than other sectors. Yeah, and you, you know, didn't um, point out billionaires have their air conditioning, but uh, yeah. the people of Bangladesh are not. So, you know. Well, and you, you point out in the section on time, uh, jumping ahead, this it's not a straight line. Beautifully, it, it is wheels within wheels. But that the one thing we seem universally and have always been. Um, universally ill-equipped to handle is long-term planning for collective future, right? And we're coming face to face with that. And I'm wondering just as we continue to stew and bake in, in language and time and beauty uh, um, and uh, fire, do you think that collective, that ability to plan for our collective future, that sense of ourselves as a super organism, do you think that's going to emerge more? I mean, are we seeing that with people like Greta and the, and the new generation of climate activists? That, that is this coming in, or do you think that's always going to be difficult for us? I mean, it's hard to know, isn't it? Because the way we're acting and behaving as a collective super organism has kind of um, this cultural system has kind of overtaken, in a way, our biological system, our cognition, mm. um, and the way that we understand ourselves. So it's it's very difficult. Um, 
uh, now we have evolved um, societies that um, act more in the collective interest than um, act in the individual interest. And we can see those different um, societies playing out. So, um, so you know, a generalization is that Asian societies are more collectivist and um, American societies, North American societies are more individualistic. Mm. Um, and we can see, so for example, this pandemic, it's, it's a result of our system, systemic effect this whole pandemic, it's because we are a super, super organism. It's because we decided to, um, you know, we are destroying parts of an intact ecosystem. And why are we doing that? Well, because um, collectively we have decided to assign a value to, to something which is essentially, um, in terms of survival value, worthless. So mm. say, say, let's say pangolin scales. Pangolin, sc pangolin scales are made out of keratin. It's exactly the same as we have in our fingernails, right. right? But people are not interested in selling and buying fingernails because they have no value. They have no cultural value. But if we assign a cultural value, so they become worth um, uh, destroying an intact rainforest for or bringing out of a rainforest. And then because we live in systems, because we live um, as a um, society that's very... That, that needs and um, thrives on um, interaction, on social interaction. That's that is how our species gets to this state because we need to share ideas and resources and everything. So we're very closely knit together. That means uh, a um, a pathogen that that um, has a new opportunity to go from an animal host to a human host and then spread around those people. And because our systems are so intertwined that has a knock-on effect of our uh, economic system we have the shutdown we have um, job losses we may see um, and, and and this plays out with populist governments it plays out with um, democracies and we see all these different systems reacting and responding um, to what essentially um, was an environmental problem to start with um, because they're all so intertwined. And, and we can see the responses as well if we look at which societies have a more collectivist mindset and which societies have a more individualistic mindset. And we can look at the way, because we copy each other, that's how we learn, that's how our culture um, passes uh, from one individual to another, down the generations and across society. But what's interesting, you know, obviously the East-West paradigm is, is uh, limited at best, but it's interesting that that the, even the cultures that we consider that we talk about as collective seem to not value not the individual lives, like not the the, the well being of everybody, but the well being of a very small minority. And this is what I'm. Well, it's true, and of course, it's complete. This is completely true, and it's and um, it's much 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 more complex than I'm making out. But if you look, for example, if you look, for example, in the United States. Um, if you look at this idea that people have over um, individual freedom mm. and individual rights, these these people are much more are much less likely to be wearing masks, are much more likely to uh, vote Republican. If you look at the other end of the scale, they're much more likely to protect each other with masks, are much more likely to take this seriously as a social problem that affects everyone. And it is a social problem that affects everyone because it's a pandemic, it's a pathogen that passes between people. Um, and so you see that playing out there. You see, if you look at things like mask wearing compliance, if you look at uh, whether or not people take this, um, believe that this is a, um, exactly the same as flu and it's a hoax, or whether you, you know, whether you think it's your right to decide uh, whether to um, go to a gather, have a, hold a gathering of lots of people, or whether you think not, you know, all these things um, into play. Um, but because this is a pathogen which thrives on, um, which, which can only be passed through communities. Community action is, and community, the the cultural mindset of people is actually really, really important. It is, but I also wonder: Do you? I mean, do you see this as just a bump in the road, or because this seems to attack the very fundamental um, everything at the very beginning? It was like the, the largest cities were hit hardest, the most dynamic places, the most advanced places, the most exciting place. Like everything we value seemed to be under attack, and it's changing now. It's spread out. It, it's not quite as stark the difference between how it's hitting um, rural areas and urban areas, but. When you look at this particular disease, because it is, as you're saying, it's so social, 
do you think this is just a bump in the road for us, something like a Spanish flu or, or, or you know, even brutal as polio or it's these things that we've gotten through? Or do you see this as slightly more insidious in the sense that it might change? You know, already we're a little less likely to be spending time with people. We're certainly not hugging each other the way we used to. We're certainly, you know, do you see this as a, just a, a, you know, is this the kind of thing, do you worry at all that, that this is going to stop us from continuing with fire and, and language and beauty and all these things? No, no, I don't think okay. it will stop that. Because, so so the reason it started in cities, of course, is because it's almost a visual, it's a visualisation of how everything passes. That's why cities are such fabulous, exciting places, because ideas pass just as the virus is passing. Because they... They need that. They need that bed of uh, humans that are interacted, that interconnectedness, and so that's how it's working. But of course, now we um, pollution have created um, fake togetherness, right? right? Like I'm talking to you. You know, you're just a few inches away from me on my screen, mm -hmm. and yet I have no. Um, I'm not going to give you the disease. You're not going to give me the disease. Right. And yet we are sharing ideas as though we were right next to each other. So we have invented ways of getting around that. And of course, we have the internet. And of course, we have all sorts of other um, ways of doing this. But I do think this needs to be a wake-up call um, in, terms of, in terms of this collectivist and individualistic mindset when we are talking about these huge global problems to our superorganisms. So whether we're talking about this pandemic or whether we're talking about global climate change, these are not problems that um, individuals can, you know, I can wear a mask all I like or, um, you know, drive my car or, um, you know, only mm -hmm. buy renewable electricity or whatever. That's not going to do absolutely anything in terms of solving the global problem. We have to do it as a global community. And it's the same, of course, with this pandemic. I might not catch it myself, that's the difference, but at the same time, that will be, it will be out there and all the systems that I rely on, are you know, well, yeah. um, which are everybody else, it, it, nothing can function. We can't get close to each other. We can't have book events. We can't travel. We can't do all the things. We're, we're kind of on hold. We can't, mm. can't keep going until this pandemic is relieved. And, and we're doing this, of course, through the incredible, unprecedented sharing that scientists are doing at the moment. Mm. So scientists in the UK, in um, China, in, um, in the United States, all these countries that are currently like fighting each other in various economic ways or, or cultural ways or whatever, the scientists are collaborating as never before. And so as a result, we have and treatments and these trials, like I've never seen anything like it. It's, it's really exciting. And that's because the scientists are not um, involved in this separatist uh, individualistic um, thing. They're, they're all um, collaborating on this collective joint effort. Right. Um, and that's that's what we're seeing and that's what will get us through and then we will continue. And I guess that, you know, it's to coin a phrase, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times, right? We're really seeing now what we're made of. Um, I want to make sure we touch on, on beauty as one of the four because this was the one that is sort of the least uh, uh, obviously intuitive, uh, I think, for, you know, before I read the book, but it makes so much sense. And I love, love, love that beauty is where we find the economy. And I think this is such a strange way of thinking about it when culturally now we seem to look at the economy as if it's a fact of nature, as if it exists outside of ourselves, as if it is not part of our culture. Um, but let's just, I want to just, let's talk about beauty as you, as, as, a, as, a, as it is an influencer on our evolution and, and who we are now. Yeah, so to me, this is something, um, it's very human, mm. this idea that, that we, we put a value on something which is, which is worthless in terms of our survival. Um, we beautify everything. Uh, you know, a, a knife isn't going to cut better if it's got um, lovely carvings on its handle or, um, mm. or a pretty, particularly pretty wood is chosen, you know? Um, and yet we will go to that extra effort. And people do, people will die for their art, literally. Um, and that's, that's kind of strange, isn't it? Because um, if you think of the time and effort that we expend um, in our lives, it's, it's you know, um, to give so much over to beauty when it doesn't, it doesn't feed us, it doesn't keep us safe, it doesn't keep us warm, any of these survival benefits, there must be another reason. And um, 
I think what it comes down to really is this idea that the way we act is in groups. So we collaborate and we draw these um, these useful um, societies that I, I was, we were talking about, um, not just with our family, not just with people that we share our genes with. So if you look at ants that are all helping each other, they're all like genetic clones, right? So they're helping their, each other's genes. We'll uh, do this with complete strangers. And so if we are going to... If we're going to put out a lot of effort to help somebody who is not part of our genetic gene pool, which we do all the time as people, we do it yeah. all the time. You know, if you hold the door open for somebody, or if you say, excuse me, um, as a politeness before you do something, you're, you're expending effort for somebody that you're not related to. And quite often we do it more to people that we're not related yeah. to. <laughs> if you see how I talk to people. <laughs> That's for sure. But you know, so what we're doing is if essentially we're forming a group and we're saying that you are my cultural family. You're not related genetically mm. to me, but you are related to me in other ways. And the way that I can show and we can show each other that we are a cultural family mm. is by um, visual signifiers. So um, if we all uh, wear clothes, for example, Right. And in the West, we all wear, I don't know what it is, jeans. Um, um, perhaps a woman will wear a sari in India or perhaps we will listen to certain music or um, we will use a knife and fork to eat. We will do various things which are social norms. And these are to sort of signify that we ascribe to this group. We will do... Um, we will follow these little rules, and we will and, we will and just those, appreciate. Those are essentially they become invisible to us, right? Because all these same people that are you know, we just talked to the anti-mask people, the the hillbillies, none of them are anti-pants, or very few of them would be, you know, and they don't even think about the fact that we've constrained ourselves. I'm so like, relieved. To wear pants. I'm so relieved about this. I'm so relieved that none <laughs> <Thank> of them. <laughs> <you. Yeah. laughs> because this is a horrible, horrible image that's just appeared in my mind. <laughs> Too much freedom. Yeah, exactly. The but, MAGA yeah, so, hat, the MAGA hat, and oh, then nothing. And nothing else. Paddington Bear style. Yeah. Oh God. But you know, we so but this all becomes invisible to us, right? The the, the things that we never think about, knife and fork, drinking from a cup, um whatever, shaking hands, bumping fists, however we're going to do it in, in the yeah, new world. Yeah, or, or in America, they do things that, that for, in Europe, we find very strange, like um, like this kind of flag allegiance and singing to oh, the God. flag in, in high school. I mean, we don't, I don't know if they have that in Canada, but in, in Britain, that's like, no, we just never, ever do that, ever. Yeah. And we actually no. have a queen, for God's sake. There's a small, yeah, well, yeah, and we, well, we have the same queen, uh, for now, yeah. at least. Yeah. Uh, there, Sorry. There, there is oh, a... <laughs> Yeah, there, 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 that is definitely um, fascinating, though, how, how blind we are to so much of, of what underpins. And, and, and again, well, we think this, this is the way, this is because we ascribe to these social norms and we think this is the only way and this is the right way and this is the good way. And people who yeah. do this are right and good people. They're cleverer, they're better than those like barbarians in the next door mm -hmm. country that are doing God knows what, those Mexicans. Oh, what are they doing? I don't know, eating chilies. <laughs> or whatever the norm is, yeah. okay? Yeah. Um, we, we, and to do this, to show that we're part of the group, part of that is saying we're better than the other group. We're much better than them. They're terrible. We're lovely. And so there's this kind of tribalism that is part of our evolution because, because we are so, so dependent. None of us can survive alone. Right. All right? None of us can survive alone. None of us can do anything alone. None of us can make a pen alone to write with. Um, we we require help from from our birth, from our literal birth onwards. We require the assistance of others who are not related to us. And so, the need to show that we are part of this cultural family is incredibly is incredibly strong. And that um, that means that we invent all these things that we then that that I call beauty. That I right. say are, are they. they they have value, really, really strong value, the sort of value that we will kill somebody if they are doing the wrong thing, singing the wrong song at the wrong time or whatever. Mm -hmm. we, will, we, we can kill somebody over that. And yet it's meaningless. It's completely meaningless in terms of survival. You know, a dog would not understand this. So, okay. so we have our societies move on uh, with all this. So we have this tribalism, which is really important in order to you know, in order to cement this very strong society that we all rely on because our evolution depends on the strength of the group. 
right. not the strength of us individuals. We are only strong as our group is strong. So uh, the strongest group means that the more chances we we'll each have of our genes surviving. So we want our, you know, this group selection idea. And right but at now, the same though, time, yeah. go beyond that, right? Yeah. We also have this kind of paradox in that we would get nowhere if we were an isolated group. In fact, if you look through um, history, isolated groups do very, very badly. They either die of inbreeding, because yeah. genetically it's no good, or they die of natural inbreeding. Their technologies become more simplified. Mm -hmm. they, um, they, they lose the complexity they need, that diversity of ideas that they need to survive changes in the environment or changes in the social environment. So it's no good. The only way that your group can survive is if it is um, interacting with other groups. So we actually, even though we all subscribe to this, we're better and this is our group, we're all secretly doing deals with all the other tribes, right, right? or not so secretly. Um, so, that, you know, if you look at the sex between groups, mm -hmm. this idea that there is some sort of racially pure, um, uh, you know, uh, Texan yeah. or something yeah, or this yeah, yeah. or whatever is, is an absolute fallacy. We are all so inbred. Yeah, and if there was a racially pure Texan, it would be a Mexican, I guess. And we know what? that would Indeed. be, you know, Spanish and indigenous. And, and again, we Indeed. go back and back and back and we're all... Yeah, so, indigenous Americans are, are very yeah. closely related to, yeah, to um, Mongolians and, and back and back and back. And we, we're, all, we're all completely related and we rely on our strength. The reason we got to this situation as a superorganism is... Because we trade with each other, we trade in resources, in ideas, in genes, in everything. Otherwise, we couldn't have become this so incredible. This is part of the road to the superorganism, which I just love. This hominy, this notion that you you're, yeah. you're, that we're, and you see this. Kind so I'll of... just, I'll just, sorry, I'll just oh, yeah. so finish this because I didn't really yeah. explain. So they're basically beautifying objects and making things just because they're beautiful. They become things that can be traded. You know, they are things that you can trade um, to lower the risk of transactions that actually matter. So um, between uh, if you're hungry, if you're a hungry tribe and you want some food, you can trade something beautiful, which is, helps nobody, but it has a value. Yeah. Right. And so they will buy that and give you food so you can survive these periods. And and so so it has that transactional value as well. And it's just um it's just incredibly powerful, and I don't really think it's been appreciated what a strong mm -hmm. role it has in our in our evolution. Yeah, well, yeah. and this is what I just love too that it, it, it's. I mean, there's so much that is optimistic and inspiring about this book, but it, really that whole through line of beauty and beauty. And we think right now with inequality being the way it is, and the kind of state violence happening against uh, protesters uh, uh, in Canada and the states and all over the world, and all the, it's it, we, we forget that it really started because we were looking at a beautiful shell and that beauty had value because we're cultural beings, because we we can tell a story about that beauty or that beauty evokes a thought or, I mean, it's it so... It, it has meaning. It, it, yeah. And that, if anything that has meaning, if we're operating from a place of meaning, then then it's, to a certain extent, that implies that we can make changes. We can we can change what we see as beautiful, right? So features that, that we... Yeah, we have agency. Right. We have agency in our future that other animals don't have. And I don't think that as a society, as a global society, we've really realized that. I think we might talk about it, but we kind of expect to be these passive vessels that just kind of travel on and maybe climate change happens or maybe this happens or that happens, yeah. a pandemic happens. And we kind of, ex we sort of adapt to it um, and, and deal with it. But actually, one of the things I wanted to say with this book is we do have agency, we have purpose. This has sort of happened to us, this, um, this evolutionary process over these hundreds of thousands of years, and we've created this world without and without purpose. But now, you know, we can recognize that now, and we can, we do have this opportunity to visualize a world that we want that's better, and then make a collective agreement to plan to achieve it. We do have this opportunity, and, and no other animal does. They right. they they are just um, their entire lives depend on us what we decide to do in the next few decades. Well, let's hope we are wise, right? Let's hope we lean into the the better angels of our nature. And uh, now, 
before I let you go, I did realize we haven't talked about time specifically, although time obviously runs through uh, all of this. And just, it, it's not that f important a question, but you talk about the cyborg in the book, this, this uh, genetic, at the beginning, uh, um, a man who has genetically modified himself. And so he can perceive, uh, he's colorblind, and so now he can perceive color. The thing you're talking about where he wants to have a, a kind of... Um, what is it, a hot spot that moves around his head so he can perceive time and you suggest that or that he suggests that once he can perceive time he's hoping to, that he can change how time works on him in the same way that we an optical illusion uh feels real and is real to us could you could just talk a little bit about I, I just think that's such a neat idea that if we could perceive time as a physical sensation then we could change our relationship with time yeah, so, so time really for humans is invented. We mm. invent our own time. And so we don't, we, we have our own mind time, which is very different from time, you know, the, the sun rises and falls, well, actually the earth moves around <laughs> the sun, but it feels like the sun is rising through and falling through our day. Um, and the stars move around um, according to a set pattern. Um, and that's the external true time, I guess. But the way we see time, I mean, if you just think about this lockdown period, it mm. feels like it feels like if we think back to February, that feels years and years ago yeah, to me. Um, it feels like a different era. And yet it was just a few months, you know. Um, so, so our perception of time is very changeable and all sorts of things can change that. Um, it changes our perception of time. Um, our age, if we're older, time feels very different from when we're young. Um, so, so our relationship to time is actually, it's fasc to me, it's really fascinating and, and how, how we can change that and how it rules our life. It completely rules our life, but it didn't rule our life in the same way tens of thousands of years ago or even hundreds of years ago. So that in itself is, is very interesting. Mm. But then this idea that if you perceive time, because that's another thing about us. When we, when we ascribe a cultural value to something, it changes the way our body perceives it. Um, you, you can see that with language, for example. So, uh, so languages that have words for colors, people perceive those colors um, differently than languages that don't have that word, don't have color. So, so in languages um, that don't name the color orange, um, people don't see the orange as clearly as um, people, speakers of language like English who, who have a separate word, a distinct word um, for orange. And that's true with, with all sorts of things. There's um, a, uh, Robin Wall Kimmerer, the, um, uh, she deals with moss and the plant world, um, in, in, points out that in, in her indigenous language, there isn't a word, that words aren't nouns in the same way, that it is not a hill, it is being a hill. And I love this idea. I mean, that changes how you think of a hill, right? It is not, yeah, it is not a thing. Exactly. It is land that is behaving as a hill right now. It's a process. So because, exactly. So because we are cultural beings, mm. this, this triad, this environment, culture, and biology are all so interlinked. So our biology, which is, which is our brains and our eyes and how we see and understand things, is completely... Um, um, is completely changed by our cultural invention of whether our language um, describes it in a certain way or, or doesn't, and, and how we how we see time is very different among different mm -hmm. cultures as well. Um, so yeah, so the physical sensation that Neil Harbison is this cyborg um, who right. who is um, having this the physical sensation of time passing is it, it's very likely. Um, that that will completely transform the way he understands time. And so if he then slow, if he has, um, it takes a year or it takes a few months for, um, for this uh, thing to rotate around his skull, giving him the sensation of time as it actually occurs, mm. if he then slows that down, then his years are going more slowly. So he's aging more slowly. And I think that's, I think it's a, a beautiful idea. I think it's a beautiful idea. You know, it's so, it's the complexity, this is where we get caught up. Uh, you know, we're certainly all caught up in, in COVID and, and being worried about survival and, and going back to school. I mean, this is madness. Uh, one of the things you talk about in the book is how all cultures universally value teachers uh, above uh, all others because they're so important. And uh, 
I'm a little worried that that is not the case right now, or doesn't seem to be the case, at least in, in, in uh, I don't know what's happening in the UK, but here in Canada. Well, certainly in terms of, yeah, in terms of the risk, but in just in terms of payment, in some, cu in some cultures, teachers are... Yeah. And in, in my country, not so much. No. Um, but yeah, in terms of the risks that we expect them to undergo, and it's the same with, with uh, other, you know, nurses and doctors, and then and then we have multimillionaires who, <laughs> who are not directly saving lives or teaching no. the next generation or um, keeping our cities free from from sewage and filth. They're they're really uh, and they're remunerated completely differently, and that's because of a quirk in our cultural system that that has led these people to be valued financially a lot more than people who actually are essential to our survival and so hopefully this will change with language like one of the, uh, um i just just finished reading so it's top of mind entangled life by merlin sheldrake where he's looking at the fungal reality and one of the things he I suggests read this and it oh it's great. so good it is so fun yeah um, i have a bit of a thing for fungi so yeah no <laughs> and i know you talk about it beautifully in the book and and you think you'll love his book but one of the things he suggests that i just want to end with as an i because i love this as an idea is that he's saying the word biology is needs to be let go of and because it's really all ecology when you start to get down to it, all of the things that are living in us, all of the things that are living around us, and this it fits perfectly with what you're talking about, this the interconnectivity being what we are and who we are. So Yeah. Yeah, we are our devices, we are our culture, and we are, of course, our environment, our ecology, because uh, we cannot survive without them. They are what made us. They are what yeah. made us. Oh, man. Well, this has been so fantastic. I want to thank you for being with us, and uh, I want to encourage everybody to get a copy of Transcendence. Shop locally. Uh, wherever you are, there are independent booksellers, bricks-and-mortar stores. Uh, look at that beautiful book. Um, go get one. If you're here in Ottawa, you can go to Perfect Books. We'll have uh, book plate signed copies uh, available for you there, limited number. Um, and... Uh, Gaia, thank you so much for the book. I can't wait until Thanks. we've evolved through the COVID and we can get you here um, in person so we can really uh, uh, continue the conversation. It'd be amazing. Thanks so much for talking thank you. to me.